welcome this evening to Sphere of Fire and myself, Donna Mitchell Moniak, spending a night with Tibetan imagery. You are welcome to put a question in the question box and I will check that periodically. And it would be my joy to respond to anything that comes up in that question box. Tonight we explore a vast subject and one that is applicable to our everyday life. I'm going to read the first couple of slides just for the sake of the clarity of them. All life forms are antenna and human beings, we are specifically multi-layered frequency transmitters and receivers. Currently in our cosmos and for some time to come, for generations to come, planet Earth is currently being flooded with new cosmic frequencies that was signified with the Mayan calendar. It is signified by various astrological occurrences happening right now and our placement of our solar system in union with the sun in its relationship to the galactic center of the Milky Way. Human beings next to Mother Earth herself have the greatest range of capacity to receive, awaken to, and embody these frequencies that are coming into Earth. Down the ages, the alchemical and metaphysical teachers of humanity have known about the spectrum of the human capacity for energy, vibration, and frequency, and they passed on the information through symbols. The teachings on the subtle energetic system, dimensions of consciousness, and participation in magical powers such as levitation, compassion, creation, and more are rendered in simple form through the various traditions. And so if we look at the world spiritual traditions, the highest and most achieved ones use colorful and often enigmatic symbols to convey volumes of teaching and practice methods. In doing so, they accomplish two goals. First, providing teachings regarding the spiritual nature of a human being to the practitioners of their time. And secondly, providing timeless instruction to future generations. And we are those future generations. Our job as we explore these symbols tonight, the sacred Tibetan symbology in some manner, or if we were to explore Mayan or Egyptian as just three examples. It is not our job to try to replicate what the ancients practiced, but instead, and with this information, this symbolic, robust information, to access the range of human spiritual beingness and consciousness that is innate to all of us and to find the right ways to express that for our time and in this time of world need. So this presentation is generated from largely that aspiration to create a forum of discussion and understanding where we understand that, yes, these ancient traditions, and specifically tonight and in the six-week course, the Tibetan imagery and its tradition. Yes, they hold great volumes and volumes of information about practice, the subtle energy systems, the cosmos, and more. But more importantly, that information must be applied to our life and, again, to the currents of energy that the world is receiving right now, the changes those currents are, uh, are bringing forward in frequency and in vibration in all kingdoms on our planet and the earth herself 
but certainly within the human kingdom. So tonight, you being here, and those who will watch this by webcast, your participation in this presentation itself is, from my point of view, simply a beginning. And I certainly encourage you to register for the upcoming online course for the world, for its transformation, and for yours, because we are specifically receivers and transmitters of energy on our planet. And the symbology contained within the ancient sacred uh, Tibetan imagery tells us how to access the fuller range of our capacity for these frequencies and vibrations and how to embody them and help our world. So the Tibetan imagery has roots, and those roots are some that have been mentioned already. The vibrational layers of human consciousness, the human subtle energetic system, as well as meditative cultures of Asia. And why Asia? Well, because Buddha Shakyamuni, from whom Tibetan Buddhism stems, he was born in, in India. And his teachings, called the Dharma, for those that might not be familiar with the term, that means his teachings, they established, and he did, within the over 40 years that he taught after his enlightenment. And he traveled in the entire subcontinent area and into the um, lower Himalaya region. The Buddha himself birthed into a culture that was rich already for thousands of years in spiritual epic poetry and stories. Some of us are familiar with things like the Mahabharata, the Vedas, Upanishads, uh, the Bhagavad Gita as examples. And as India is one of the oldest continuous cultures on earth, it already had tales and images of many armed and many headed beings. Anyone who's read the Ramayama, that's a good example of that. So stories of these higher realms and otherworldly beings, such as dragons, garudas, or nagas, were already known and told within India, the place of the Buddha's birth. However, a naga on the left is not only a being, and it is that, it is a being, but it also represents something. It represents our inner fires and their taming. So that all has to do with our subtle system. It also has to do with our passions. It has to do with how we use our mind. A Garuda is, yes, a celestial bird, but it is also, and it, again, it is a real being in these inner and intra-dimensional realms that are part of the realms of consciousness and of our planet. But a Garuda is not only that, but it also is uh, or represents the conquering of our inner poisonous attitudes, such as pride, aggression, ignorance, and such. It represents this um, flight of mind that is possible and flight of awareness that is possible once we are not limited by or weighed down by the negativities that can occupy our mind. So over the centuries of Buddhist meditation practice, many Buddhist adepts experienced inner realms. They experienced this variety of realms of the psyche, dimensions of being, literally additional realms other than the dense physical realm of our world. They experienced these things as well as experiencing how to traverse the path, the spiritual path, ultimately towards enlightenment, which many of these Buddhist adepts achieved. The Buddha Shakyamuni is not the only being who achieved enlightenment. He is supreme in that his level of enlightenment was unsurpassed. And that just reports to it that 
that there are levels to enlightenment, just like there are levels of kindness and levels of generosity. So simply, hundreds of years before Carl Jung put forward the idea of archetypes, which commonly now are known as Jungian archetypes, Buddhist masters and practitioners experienced many layers of these archetypes, as well as the capacity of the human being to express and embody high vibrational frequencies. And many of these adept meditators experienced these realms and these states with very robust dynamic imagery. And many of them uh, depicted it such that it could be used as a teaching uh, tool. So we all know the common phrase that a picture is worth a thousand words. And that is so. We all can look at something such as this image on the screen and have any number of things that we would say about it. Well, that's odd. This being has six arms. Or, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, look at the way the flowers caress around this image of this being. What are those little things in the bottom, those round balls? So there's all kinds of things that we could question and ask and say. And therefore, a picture truly is worth. A thousand words. Therefore, supported by the teachings of the Buddha and instructed in the rigorous scientific training of the mind, these master practitioners found within themselves a whole set of instruction and a whole set of teaching. It again came initially from the Buddha but in the wide variety of ways that it is presented in Tibetan imagery, that came from inside these adept meditation practitioners. In so, so presenting it, though, it also provided detailed visuals for students like us or, or students of their own for contemplation and meditation. So part of our exploration has specifically to do with a tanka. Well, what is a tanka? A tanka is a hand-painted scroll or wall hanging, and it was originally intended to be portable. The Tibetan people were nomadic people unless they were in a citified area or in a, the area of a monastery. And if they were in the place of a monastery, because a monastery had several large buildings and thousands of monks would occupy it, nunneries had hundreds of nuns. But by the same token, these monasteries were the universities of Tibet. And it is said that Tibet had more documents, more tomes of literature written by the Tibetan masters on the wide variety of subject matter, that there was more in Tibet than in the Library of Alexandria. So then, as these tankas needed to be transportable, moved from place to place, from monastery to monastery, and as they needed to do that, they made them into a scroll form and move them around. Let me just check one thing, everybody. So every tanka, oops, let's go back. Every tanka that's created is hand created. There's no machinery used for a tanka. That's important because the artist is engaged, or the small group of artists make, working on one is engaged in 
a meditative process. There is mantra used during the painting. There is mantra used in just the stretching of the canvas. And the whole process is a meditative one um, and one that is intended to bring the vibration and set of vibrations of these celestial forces pictured in the imagery presented that also mirror to us our celestial capacity. So I hope I said that clearly. Every step along the way is again done by hand from the canvas, which is all of natural fabric. And of course, in the old days, could have been animal skin, but usually it was some form of fabric um, that is hand stretched. And the pigments, fatankas, are almost all made from hand ground minerals. Now they might have some form of minor machinery to do that, but the process is a sacred process and it is considered um, necessary to stay uh, true to the embodiment of every step of the process and uh, to hold it all as completely sacred. And so you see with the bottom images, these two people who are monks, but the middle image being that the pigments that are going to be used are again empowered with mantra uh, prayed over meditated over and that image behind them is majushri so suggesting possibly that these paints are being used for a majushri mandala every tanka and all Tibetan imagery uh, are for the purpose of instruction. That is to, for us, if we are Buddhist practitioners or Dharma practitioners, that is to help us understand the Dharma. Again, what is the Dharma? The Dharma is the teachings from the Buddha and all the masters who then took that original teaching contemplated on it, meditated on it, applied to their culture, to their time, to their life circumstances, and that is all so-called the Dharma. It's the, it's the whole string or river of the Dharma. Any Tanka or any Tibetan imagery is also for reflection and contemplation, to consider, well, what is this symbol reporting to me? What is there to meditate on? And therefore, it's for meditation. And then finally, every tanka, not only one that has this kind of an image of literally a path, but all tankas, and again, almost all Tibetan imagery, present to us the spiritual path. And therefore, the path as the life. So with all of that in mind, we can approach this Tibetan imagery if, let's say, we are not a Dharma practitioner, we have no interest in Buddhism, but maybe we want to uh, support a meditation practice, make it more refined, take it to a new level. Well, then, the imagery still would support that because, again, these were great meditation masters who created the original forms of the tankas that just keep being repeated and repeated over the centuries. We might find that we are troubled in our mind or in our uh, behavioral habits. We're troubled. We can't quite make the change that we keep trying to make. And so we might find that to use some of the sacred Tibetan imagery and what it represents and the instruction that it offers, that that might actually uh, support us to make that, that actual change. And then finally, going to what we said earlier, you know, these images, and this one as an example, well, very few of us are monks, and very few of us live in some idyllic scene where there's 
forests all around or rainbows in the sky and things like that. So how are we to apply it now in our life at this world change time, at this cycle where we know that we cannot keep going the way that we're going as a collective humanity. There's only so many resources in the world. The air is polluted. You know, disease still exists and rampantly so. So we know that that's an untenable solution or an untenable situation. So then how can this ancient thousand-year-old imagery how can this support us? How can this teaching support us too? To embody the higher vibrations and frequencies that all of us as receivers and transmitters of frequency, how can we embody that more? And how can we uh, avail ourselves of these great celestial forces that are absolutely uh, affecting our planet, changing its uh, biomagnetic sphere, changing and adapting how the sun and its sunspots are happening and therefore how the solar winds and EMFs are affecting our planet. So these things are real. And then how, therefore, how can this ancient system of imagery help us now in our day? And I think that it can, and that's why I'm offering this course. So I'll just stop for a second and see if there's any questions. And I don't see anybody typing, so we'll proceed. Everything in a tanka has meaning. That would apply, of course, to any mural or wall art as well. Every color, line, shape, ornament, lack thereof, everything. A lotus, a throne, what animals are there. Is it being naked or clothed or some combination thereof? Everything has meaning. To someone who's even minimally aware of some of the layers of meaning, this is tremendous instruction. Just one second, we see a couple of questions have come in. Oh, yes, Cecile. Um, Tonkas are being made uh, right now in uh, Nepal, um, in Dharamsala, India, in India overall. There are various places to make them, but in Dharamsala, and Spiritfire has access and can procure some from Dharamsala. Um, these are made by Tibetan refugee painters. Um, uh, so they are being made still in several countries, handmade by, by those artists. There are lineages, if you will, within uh, the creation of Tibetan Tonka painting. And uh, so again, there's a Nepalese style, there's a Indian style, and certainly there's a Tibetan style. And when they were for a short time being made, short time being a couple of hundred years, maybe maybe about 300 at max. Um, they were being made in China when uh, there was a very powerful, positive relationship between um, the Chinese emperor, who was um, not only patron to the Dalai Lama, this goes back again in the, um, maybe the, maybe the 1300s, 1300s or 1400s or so, um, but there was not only a very positive patron relationship, but in fact, uh, the, the Dalai Lama of the time and his regent were also tutors of the, I think it was the Manchu emperor, but I'm not sure which emperor it was. 
So in that time, there was also Chinese tankas being made and a Chinese influence into the tanka painting art. And what is the difference between a tanka and a mandala? Um, words, that's all. That's the only difference. Um, as we will take up in week one of the tanka class, and we're getting to a slide in that regard, um, a tanka is a mandala. I mean, we can see right here on the one on, on our screen right now. That's a, there's, a, there's a complexity to it, as well as a simplicity. There are many factors going on. So, so in one sense, that's what a mandala is. Um, but then also you have some that are more um, classically, what we've come to understand from the word mandala, but specifically because of, let's say, a sand painting, a sand mandala. Um, so the answer is yes, they are actually uh, almost synonyms. Um, nothing on or in a tanka is for artistic reasons only. That's very important and can only be repeated. Nothing on or in a tanka is for artistic reasons only. The artist actually, whether or not one says that they have freedom or not with a tanka, um, the freedom is the choice of what to choose to paint. Are they going to choose to paint green Tara, what's on the screen? Are they going to choose to paint green Tara in her role as prote protectress or in her role as and her embodiment of mother of Buddhas? As an example. So with that then, and because my orientation tonight and for the six-week course is to not only explore Tibetan imagery for its own sacred sake as a sacred art form, but also to apply it directly to ourself and our full range of human beingness and, again, our responsibility for being human in this time in the world. So we would look at them, you know, well, what does that mean and how do I apply it? Green Tara, what does that mean as a protectress? What does that mean as mother of the Buddhas? Tankas and Tibetan Buddhist imagery always offer an exploration of one's mind. That's what the imagery is designed for. And therefore, because our mind creates our reality, then it is an exploration of one's reality. Both the current reality that we are living, presented to us by imagery, by presenting how we have our habits, how we have our fears, how we have this or that. So even in an image such as this, if we knew how to read the Tanka, there are images of how to overcome our fears and what might those fears be? How to overcome our anxieties? What might those anxieties be? So it displays both the, if you will, the troublesome as well as the antidote and ultimately the equilibrized or clarified or um, serene state that is possible for everyone when we do address whatever is troublesome and come to a, a cleaner, clearer sense of wholeness. At the same time, all Buddhist imagery, tankas of course, are a set of instructions. So again, anyone that knows what they're looking at can look at an image such as this and one, two, three, four, five. There's a set of instructions here. And then we can take that on. Is that set of instructions specific to a Buddhist path? No, not at all. Because the Tonkas and Tibetan imagery are 
ex about the exploration of our states of mind, our states of, um, again, troublesome habits, habits of mind, habits of emotions, physical plane habits, as well as our view of the physical plane dimension. Do we put our preference there? Do we feel limited by it? All these kinds of things. So because the Tonka is actually exploring the mind and our state of reality and the possibilities of reality, then no, this is not about Buddhism per se. Um, it's about a smart way to look at one's life. So the upcoming six session online course presents, you know, all of this and more in a way that is, or well, at least my goal is that it's applicable to everybody and their life and to the world transformation that we're in as to why are we incarnated now? Why are we here now during this time in the world? And so more about that um, coming up. And just a brief little overview, if you will, on what will we cover in this six-week course. Keep in mind that an online course, in addition to being green, because there's no transportation and such like that, um, it is also convenient, of course, because if one can't be there for the live session of class, one can uh, have the webcast. The webcast doesn't expire. It's there for whenever it's convenient for you. So if you have an interest in this course, you know, by the time this presentation is over, or if your interest is already peaked, don't let the 8 o'clock on Tuesday nights, you know, scare you away if that's a time that is inconvenient for you. No, just know that it's webcasted and it's there for you. And, you know, questions and comments, etc., can be sent to me and I will include them in the class. So session one speaks about oneness. And that is the mandala. And we will explore mandala. What is mandala? Well, at essence, mandala has to do with the rubric of interdependence. Because what is oneness? Oneness isn't one. Oneness isn't a singularity. Oneness is the synthesis of all complex parts coming into an integrated whole, displaying itself as a oneness. So in this case, this tanka appears to be about a central figure supported by ancillary figures or components, and we will find that in any tanka that we look at, including a more one one that looks more like like a san mandala, you know, with just octagonal shapes or square shapes, etc. We will find that there is a central point, and then a lot of stuff around it. So the truth is that every of these images is actually picturing reality as a mandala, the mandala of experience and existence, and how all experience and existence is mandala, is interdependent. So it's a very rich exploration unto itself, and it immediately is applicable in our life because it immediately brings forward the, the clarity of moment as interdependence, as our self as interdependent, et cetera, et cetera. Session two, week two, we'll take up two-ness and the foundation of two. That foundation is the fundamental duality that we live in, abide in, that is unquestionable, and that's, that's the truth of it. But how can we use duality in order to arrive at clarity first and ultimately non-duality? And what is non-duality? So 
Whether or not I have an answer to that or one that even makes sense, we'll leave that for week two. But we are to understand from the Tonkas and the Tibetan imagery how foundational duality is and what are its various presentations in our life. And therefore, what are the presentations by which Tibetan imagery has offered it to us to mirror back to our minds where we are, again, in a troublesome way vis-a-vis our duality and our dualistic life and our dualistic view of life. And how can we adjust any of that troublesome view? And furthermore, what about union? What about that transcendent state or that mystical state that an artist, a runner, or a piece of person who's praying or in meditation arrives at? What about that reason that we all seek union, companionship, partnership, love? Why do we have pets? Why do we seek beauty? Why do we create it? These things and more will be covered in that week. Session three is the threes. There are many threes. Every spiritual tradition has a divine triplicity. And this imagery does too. Those threes are in our body, speech, and our mind. They are in our three-dimensional world. How can we apply these threes that are presented to us in Tibetan imagery? What is the frequency, the vibration, and the energy that is trying to arise and be embodied by each of us in our life through our responsibilities and in our world? Session four will be about the four powers. And there are various fours as well, in certainly in multiple traditions. And within this tradition, there are as well. They are all related. So if we kind of like when I teach astrology, we learn just a few words and then think of all the synonyms for them. Well, we have an understanding of that planet or that sign. And so similarly, so here, we don't need to learn a whole set of lists of fours, you know, multiple lists of fours. No, we will see that these things are completely related. And then equally so within this week of fours is four interesting contemplations. They're actually quite riveting contemplations about suffering. When we look out to the world, when we go through our day, do we have any anxiety or fear or worry? Are we concerned about this or that? Are we troubled by something that we see in the news or hear from a friend or have in our life? Well, that's, that's suffering. So the truth of that, to really contemplate that, to not put that aside, to not deny it, to not call it something else, that's a powerful contemplation. And it doesn't leave us with, oh, no, that's pretty depressing. Instead, we are inspired by the fact of it to do something to change it. And as long as we keep denying it and calling our worry or calling our anxiety or calling our fear, calling our anger something other than what it is, then nothing will change. And same with the other things mentioned here, the unpredictability of death, impermanence, no self. These things are interesting contemplations to begin with, and they actually have to do with the power that comes from contemplating on these things, as well as the four measurable powers, love, compassion, equanimity, and joy. There is no, uh, what? You can always have more. You can always create more. You can always be more love, be more compassion, be more equanimous, be more filled with boundless joy. So they are immeasurable. And again, unto themselves, they are powerful contemplations. We'll talk about them in our day, in our life, 
and instruction on how to bring them forward. There are five primary colors used within tonkas, and then they are combined, such that orange is created by combining red and yellow, obviously. A lighter blue is created by combining white and darker blue. So to start with the five primary colors, and what do they mean? They mean particular energies, each of those five. Of course, they speak of the elements, they speak of particular types of activity, they speak of particular types of awareness and levels of awareness or ranges of awareness. So then when we first look at that, here's these five colors. And then, of course, for those who do know something of the Dharma, you know that they are related to the five Buddha families and the five poisons and the five wisdoms, on and on. But then to also look at how, in any particular tanka, the colors are combined, such that we end up with whatever we do, including in an image such as this, a wide variety and wide range of color. So what does it mean when the colors are combined? Well, it means those two qualities are being combined. Those two wisdoms are being combined. So again, we'll take that all up. and see how to apply that within our own life. Maybe see how we in our life are combining certain things. And that there are other things that just aren't part of our our what? Our equipment. But these are, and how do we live them? And then session six is a six week only online class. So session six, week six, we'll take up the six virtues. And with the idea and orientation of humanity's path, the word bodhisattva means uh, enlightened being, bodhi enlightened sattva being. That's a Sanskrit word. It can also mean lighted being. Bodhi has many um, many kind of ancillary meanings to it, but they all come from the idea of light, radiance, purity, that type of thing, clarity. So at essence, humanity's path is that kind of path. It is a path of light. It is the path towards supreme excellence of heart and mind. And so... One presentation of that, or one way that all of us live that as human beings, is by virtue. And virtue has come to be a little bit of a parochial term, you know, in our kind of empiric empiricist and reductionist scientific age. Yet, what virtue is, is again, the supreme and serene qualities expressed through heart mind so we'll talk about those and a few other presentations of the sixes that as we find within us we'll find these relate to our chakra system we will find that these relate to our psychological states positive negative and everywhere in between so again these things will find direct application to our life and our uh, attempt to embody more fuller range of vibration and frequency as a human being living on our planet. So, you know, at essence, when we look at these tankas, we, and I'll use some of the ones that I own, and we'll look at you know, others that are just out and about. And again, I have access, Verify has access to uh, ones that are hand painted from Dharamsala, you know, where the Dalai Lama and Tibetan refugees are by Tibetan refugee painters. So I have some of that imagery as well. And we'll look at it, we'll use it. And at essence, we are trying to understand 
what does it all mean and what is it what is it telling me about me both from a way of transformation a embodiment of qualities that as a soul as a spiritual being we are seeking to embody in our life those things would be indicated by an astrological chart as well and then what is it telling me about the the capacity that I as a human being in contradistinction to a tree or a dog the capacity that I have to to embody these to express them to demonstrate and manifest them so I certainly hope that you will join me for this online course and you can register for it at spiritfire.com and before I go to say good night to you all um, we can look at this image and I'll hold up for some questions as we look at this image and as I read the question box, please know this is this is an example of one of the tankas from Dharamsala that we have access to. This tanka particularly um, um, was given to Grace. Some of you know Grace, dear member of the Spiritified community, and this hangs on her wall in uh, Milwaukee. And every time I go visit her, I'm so happy to see it. So let's see what we've got for questions. Cecile writes, we saw many images this evening in the classes. Will you be identifying the deity who is central to the Tonka ta as example, Tara, Padmasambhava, Prajnaparamita, etc.? Yes, absolutely, Cecile. And not only will we um, look at the specific deities or being, I will certainly give some short version or as detailed as the class wants to get into of the being itself. And then again, always with the intention to apply it to how do we live this? What do we do with this? Because not everyone who might come to the or have interest in this course is a, is a Buddhist practitioner. Um, or a Buddhist style meditator. Uh, and it is my intention and my conviction that the information is, again, like uh, ancient Egyptian uh, symbolism, like Mayan symbolism, although I know far less about Mayan symbolism, but I can still, I think, make this statement safely. These things traverse time. These things are not limited to a practitioner of the ancient Egyptian uh, understandings or of Mayan uh, background and lineage or of Tibetan Buddhist lineage and practice. I don't think that's the case. In fact, I think that that's one of the great gifts that we are receiving with you know the Tibetan Tibetan Buddhism being cast into the world by the Chinese occupation of Tibet. So the one of the great gifts of that, of course, is that this information and these uh, contemplations and this exploration of human fullness is now available to us. So whether or not we are a Dharma practitioner, um, we can avail ourselves of this information. How long is each class? Um, I will do what I can to keep it to about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and it will not exceed an hour and a half. But I hope closer to the hour, to hour and 15 minutes. Any more questions? I want to give a moment because I know it takes a moment to type. The cost, that's a good question, Seal. It's its quite affordable. I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's quite affordable. Um, please check the Spiritfire website for that. 
and you would go right to spiritfire.com uh, to the tab of education or upcoming events. Either one will get you there. I could say it's priceless, but <laughs> um, so we'll leave that alone. <laughs> And anything else for anyone. Oops, sorry about that. Just lost you. So what we have then is um, a lot of interesting imagery and uh, rich, rich exploration. So again, I hope you'll join me. And uh, thank you for coming tonight. It's been a joy to be with you. Love you all. Create your day.